Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the continuation of the California High Speed Rail Authority's Board of Directors meeting from yesterday, August 17th. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask uh, our board secretary, Mo, to uh, advise the people in the public who, how they can take advantage of our interpreter program. Thank no. you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I'd like to go over some important technical aspects of this meeting for listening in the appropriate language. First, to ensure that you hear this meeting in the correct language, everyone please go to the bottom of your screen and click on the globe icon labeled interpretation. From there, you need to select either English or Spanish or Mandarin. After you select your language, if you hear both languages at the same time, please click the mute original audio. If you hear everything clearly, there is no need to click the mute original audio button. Now I'd ask our Spanish interpreter to provide these instructions. And then after that, our Mandarin interpreter to provide these instructions. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you for being a part of this meeting. My name is Brittany. I will be one of the Spanish interpreters that will be assisting in this meeting. Uh, buenos, buenas tardes todos. Gracias por unirse a esta junta. Mi nombre es Brittany. Voy a estar uh, con mi compañero uh, dando servicios de interpretación en español. Uh, para acceder al canal de español, uh, van a encender eh, la, la característica de interpretación momentáneamente. En cuanto uh, salga, por favor, puede ver en su pantalla, en el lado inferior de su pantalla, va a haber un globito o tres puntitos. Usted va a hacer clic. Va a ver language interpretation, va a hacer clic y usted va a ver uh, el canal de español. Va a hacer clic en español y va a poner mute original audio para evitar que oiga dos voces a la misma vez. Y después van a poner done o finalizar. Por favor, si tiene alguna problema técnica, déjenos saber en la cajita de comentarios y con gusto le podríamos a proporcionarles uh, una solución. Muchas gracias y espero que disfruten la reunión. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Ming. I'm one of the Mandarin interpreter. Uh Mr. Chairman, we can move forward. All right, thank you, Mo. Ladies and gentlemen, as noted a few moments ago, our meeting has reconvened. This is the second day of a two day board meeting this month, uh, the 17th and 18th of August, 2022. I'd like the record to reflect that the board has reconvened uh, with all members present who were here in or who were in attendance yesterday with the exception of our ad hoc uh, member, assembly member Juan Rambula, or excuse me, Joaquin Rambula. Well, now move on to uh, agenda item number 11, which is the Finance and Audit Committee <coughs> report. Uh, for those of you who joined us at 10 o'clock, thank you. Uh, I'll give you just a short, a short uh, uh, reflection on today's meeting. Uh, you heard a little bit about cash management yesterday from our uh, chief financial officer. And uh, as all of our board members know, on June 30th, Governor ne Newsom signed Assembly Bill 180, which appropriated the remainder of the four point, our remaining $4.2 billion in Proposition 1A funds for work in the Central Valley. The treasurer will sell bonds uh, and, ac and we would have access to cash as early as November, excuse me. <clears throat> Total cash currently available to the authority in all funds is about $2.2 .2 billion as of today. <clears throat> of that, uh, 2.1 uh, billion is in uh, cap and trade funds, about 11 million in our real property, 
uh, fund and Proposition 1A has about $72 million. In the month of June, and all of these numbers reflect June, the total design build expenditures in June were about $53 million. <clears throat> the authority ended the 21-22 fiscal year with expenditures of about $1.2 billion, which is similar to the results of the 2021 fiscal year. Contracts and expenditures report, the authority has 219 active contracts with a total value of $9.8 billion. Uh, this is up by about $450 million from the previous month, which would have been uh, May. Uh, that is a reflection on the agreement and the funding uh, and the contract we now have with LA Union Station, uh, our four LA Union Station with LA Metro. With regards to the contingency that the, the authority has available right now, it's at $2.2 billion. With regards to the Central Valley uh, construction report, <clears throat> I'm happy to report that as of the end of June, that all 163 of our structures and guideways in CP1 through four have been fully designed and are ready for construction. <clears throat> Utility relocation status, 862 of 100, or excuse me, 1,862, or 42% are completed. Another 370 are in process. Yeah, we'll see if I cut this. I'm sorry? Okay, I just got some feedback. Uh, oh. 81, or 4% have been approved to start, and 540, that's 30%, have not started. There were 19 relocations that were completed uh, in the month of June. <clears throat> With regards to labor on, on our job sites, uh, it was down slightly uh, by about, um, um, about 38 from the month before, uh, with the average being at 1,119 a day on site. With regards to right-of-way, eight parcels were delivered in the month of June. Uh, the total parcels delivered now in CP one through four, that is 119 miles, uh, 2,112 with the total requirement of 2,309. And with regards to construction progress of those structures uh, with, of which we have 67 of 93, that's 72% underway or substantially complete. And that's no change from the previous month. And that's a short uh, update for you from uh, finance and audit. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, we will move on to our uh, next agenda item, item 11. <clears throat> Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> All right, then we'll move to agenda item uh, number 11. That's the, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> we'll move on to uh, the business at hand for the balance of this meeting. With that is that we have multiple agenda items today related to the San Francisco to San Jose section of the final EIR EIS. We will start with agenda item number 12, which is providing staff an opportunity to address any of the issues they believed were important in the public comments and any questions the board asked about yesterday. Uh, for that, I'll uh, ask uh, the same team to step forward, uh, Mr. Lipkin, Mr. Stanich, and Mr. Kennerly. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Richards. Good afternoon, board members. After the staff <coughs> presentation yesterday, we heard comments from the public expressing both support for the project and concerns regarding how the project would potentially affect community planning in Millbrae and Brisbane. After hearing comments from the public and questions from the board, the staff convened several times yesterday with our team of experts, including planners, engineers, outside hazardous materials, air quality, transportation experts, and other environmental professionals to assess whether comments raised new environmental issues or feasible alternatives and mitigation measures as required by CEQA and NEPA. Based on that review, we prepared the following presentation to clarify how these issues have been addressed in the final EIR EIS and our path forward on key items 
that the board identified yesterday. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? The topics that we plan to cover are intermodal connections and development at the Millbrae SFO station, design of the Brisbane LMF and the landfill at that location, and grade separations. At this point, I'd like to pass the presentation to my colleagues, beginning with Boris Lipkin. Uh, thank you, Serge, and good afternoon, Chairman Richards and board members. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, and starting on the Millbrae SFO station topic, uh, we wanted to give, uh, in kind of response to both the comments that we heard and the questions from the board, uh, we want to give the board a sense of the intermodal connections that exist at the station today, uh, as well as what we're proposing and how our facilities fit into that existing uh, state intermodal connection framework at the station. Uh, and how it all works together as one integrated hub. Uh, this is a station that uh, I actually used to use on my daily commute, so I'm intimately familiar with it mm -hmm. um, and want to give you a sense of uh, what, what, it, what it's like to use the station. Uh, and so the photographs here are on the northbound Caltrain platform looking north. Uh, over to the left side, you can see the southbound Caltrain platforms. And then the image on the left, uh, under those canopies are the two sets of escalators that go up to the concourse level, uh, which is how you connect to the rest of the station. Uh, on the image on the right, uh, you can see a, a cross-platform transfer between that northbound Caltrain uh, platform and the BART system. It's a little bit dark, but in the back, you can see a BART train uh, right across the fair gates uh, in the image on the right. Uh, the, uh, project cross section on the bottom just shows that uh, the, the two Caltrain platforms and tracks uh, starting on the west side, uh, the location of where we're kind of looking on the on the plat northbound platform, and then the, the BART tracks and, and platforms on the right side, uh, on the east side of the station. There are entrances and exits on both sides, and there are uh, various uh, ways to get up and down to the concourse. Uh, of course, escalators, uh, stairs, and also elevators for those uh, who might need some mobility uh, assistance. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just to, again, give you a sense of the existing station, uh, this is taken on top of that con concourse level uh, for those intermodal connections between the two systems. Uh, and so that escalator on the right, that's the, the escalator down to the uh, southbound Caltrain platform. And then across the concourse and where you see uh, the next set of signs, uh, that's where the BART part of the station is. Uh, it's all one big building with uh, two entrances and connections, again, on both sides of the, uh, of the, of the station uh, and the various functions that are up on the concourse level, including some of the ticketing uh, that you see uh, somebody using here in, in the photo. Um, so that's the existing station. And just to give you a sense of uh, how we fit into this existing facility, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, something out of our environmental document and uh, zooming in from uh, some of the kind of bigger pictures that we had shown, but really focusing on those intermodal connections. Uh, what you see in this graphic, uh, and again, trying to kind of walk you through this similarly to what we showed on the previous ones, uh, the top of the graphic uh, shows those existing three BART uh, tracks and platforms. Uh, that shared uh, cross-platform transfer that I mentioned in the first slide is that where that blue goes with the orange for the Caltrain platform. And all of that stays, all of that's part of the existing station. Where we start to make modifications is by adding the high-speed rail platform and tracks between the two sets of Caltrain uh, tracks to make sure that both mm -hmm. sets of northbound trains are going together and both sets of southbound trains are going together on the blended system. Uh, and then we tie into that overhead concourse with our vertical circulation, again, including all the requirements for the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, making sure that it's all accessible uh, for different ways to get up and down. And of course, focus very much on making sure that any possible combination of uh, how people might need to use the station connecting between the modes uh, would be as easy as possible and as convenient for the user. Uh, so that we do have that integrated hub with all of the platforms lined up, everybody using the concourse uh, to get between them. Uh, the, the section on the bottom just depicts the, the, the cross section. This one's looking south, uh, but how the two high-speed rail platform uh, tracks and the middle island platform fit into the, into the station. We maintain uh, access on the station from both the east and the west, uh, and again, make sure that it's connected to the surrounding uh, community as well. 
So B Boris, this is Martha Scutia. Just to yes, um, just to summarize, um, I see how you've added the high speed rail in purple, the little tracks right next to a Caltrain, but you're still using the same existing intermodal facility, correct? We're yeah, we're modifying the facility to add our our facilities, but yes, it's the same build. It's the same station. That's right. You're that's not going to have a separate high speed rail station. You know, it's, it's all going to be on the same existing facility as modified. Correct. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I see director Williams, were you uh, jumping on with a question or should I move on to the last slide on Milbury that I have? No, I think that answered it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That answered my question too. Okay, and then I'll just close out uh, just one more slide on Millbrae if we can go to, go to the next one. Uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday in terms of our uh, efforts in, in looking at how uh, our station can be integrated with surrounding development. Uh, transit oriented development is very important uh, to, to the authority and it supports many of our goals at the station. We talked about in the graphic on the right uh, that we're certainly not precluding and, and very much willing to work with the city on how development and our station can all fit together uh, and be integrated. And so uh, we talked about this briefly, but we did have uh, a mitigation measure uh, specifically talking about, uh, and it's listed here, our uh, commitments that we would make towards working jointly with the city to refine the preliminary station design into a final station design uh, and making good faith efforts to incorporate the, the city's feedback and maximizing opportunities uh, for the property interests available for the city's TOD uh, and our meet, while still meeting our uh, operational requirements. Uh, similarly, we've included uh, language in the resolution uh, that's before you for uh, your consideration where the board would direct staff to explore the joint design and planning opportunities with the city of Millbrae uh, when we advance from preliminary to final station design uh, in order to concurrently advance the two important statewide priorities of high-speed rail and transit-oriented development in the San Francisco to San Jose project section broadly and around the Millbury station specifically. So uh, we, we see this as, uh, in, you know, what we've done so far has been uh, important work to get to this point, but uh, these are our clear commitments to continue to work with the city on the really these really important topics around uh, TOD as we move forward. And with that, I was going to uh, turn it to Gary to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the Brisbane topics. Well, uh, thank you both and welcome to Chair Richard, board mm -hmm. members. Um, so just gonna cover three areas, uh, the, the landfill design issues, and also again, uh, the, the mitigation measures we have to continue working with the city of Brisbane. Um, but starting with the Brisbane landfill, uh, and this is shown in the picture there on the, the right. Um, let's know that any development on the east of the Bayland site will need to address the landfill. Um, now we have consulted with our hazardous material experts to verify that our final EIR EIS does analyze all the impacts of investigating, characterizing, excavating. And when we're excavating, that also includes measures to minimize uh, fugitive dust uh, that could be created during the excavation. Uh, containerizing, which is literally putting the material in containers so it is uh, sealed during transportation, uh, the transportation and disposal of the, the landfill material. Um, we also heard yesterday from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District uh, voicing their support for the project. Uh, so again, in support of the measures that we're taking, especially during transportation of this material. Uh, and as many are aware, construction in and around a landfill is heavily regulated. Uh, the authority will be working with the city of Brisbane and also the regulatory agencies, the San Mateo County Environmental Health Division, Cal Recycle, and also the Regional Water Quality Control Board during the design, construction, and ultimately landfill closure. And we see this as an opportunity for partnership to address all the landfill issues together with the city of Brisbane and the developer. Next slide. So moving on to consider the actual uh, light maintenance facility design. Uh, point to note is, I mean, our design has been focused, the design we have in the environmental document is to ensure that we have a feasible project and that we have appropriately evaluated all the project's environmental impacts. 
Um, as we heard yesterday, and we do recognize there are specific areas of focus for continued design refinement during final design. And as we heard yesterday, these include the lead tracks at the north and south, uh, access points uh, to the development, uh, including Geneva Avenue and Tunnel Avenue, uh, the, the Brisbane Fire Station, and just the overall facility footprint as well. Um, we have developed a proposed mitigation and monitoring enforcement plan measure that includes commitments for the continued collaborative design efforts with the city of Brisbane as we advance from preliminary to final design. And if we go to the next slide, I uh, wanted to like review that measure. So this is contained, uh, the authority's commitment to collaborate with the city in advancing the final design is incorporated in the mitigation measure LUMM4, uh, which is displayed here. Uh, the mitigation measure recognizes the importance of housing and TOD to the city and also commits the authority to work with the city to advance a final design that both maximizes property interests available for the Brisbane Bayland adjacent to the LMF and also meets the authority's operational requirements. Now, these commitments are also stated in the draft board resolution, which directs staff to explore joint design and planning opportunities with the city of Brisbane when advancing from preliminary design for the light maintenance facility to final design, and in order to concurrently advance the two important statewide priorities of high-speed rail and transit-oriented development in the San Francisco to San Jose project section broadly and at the Bayland site specifically. And I believe as we move this project forward, we were certainly ready and able, and we heard yesterday as well as the city, to work collaboratively to advance our design for a successful project. And with that, I would like to hand it back to Boris Lipkin to discuss some additional elements of grade separations. Uh, thank you, Gary. And uh, this is the, the last of the three main topics that we wanted to cover. Uh, I think this is in follow-up to Director Schenk, some of your comments uh, yesterday around sort of the funding and the opportunities with funding, uh, how we can support some of the local efforts around grade separations and what's been happening with that. Uh, and so just to give a sense, uh, great separations have been a key topic in the Caltrain quarter for a very long time. Uh, the quarter is 150 years old. Uh, there were plans uh, talking about fully great separating the quarter going back to at least the 1930s that, I, that I'm aware of. Mm. Um, and over time, over the decades, what we've seen is this incremental path of uh, th these great separation projects uh, slowly upgrading the corridor. Right now, between San Francisco and San Jose, about two-thirds of the crossings have been grade separated. Uh, but just to give a sense of sort of the magnitude of how much you know, interest and demand is out there for these grade separation projects, uh, in their business plan work, uh, Caltrain estimated that the if we took all the plans that, that, are, that are already in, in, in the works, uh, that uh, that's between 30 and 32 great separations uh, between San Francisco and Gilroy at a cost of nine to $10 billion altogether. And again, just for grounding purposes to give a couple of the, the last few that had been done in the corridor, uh, there were three great separations that were uh, three roads that were separated by raising up the rail tracks uh, in San Bruno uh, in 2014 that added up to uh, about $165 million. And then uh, we talked yesterday about the 25th Avenue Great Separation Project, which was uh, 200, roughly $206 uh, million and was completed last year. Uh, that's the, the, the rebuilt Hillsdale Station that you can see on the image on, on the right that was part of that project. Uh, but how we've seen these projects generally come about is by the leveraging of sources. Usually the cities have been the ones doing the, the planning and the, the effort to really pursue these Great Separation Projects, but then the funding has come from all levels of government uh, so, uh, of course, local, regional, state, and, and sometimes even federal. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I do think that the advocacy and the push about great crossings and great separations uh, it is hitting a uh, maybe a, an inflection point uh, where new funding opportunities have come online just in the last uh, couple of you know year or two even. Um, and so uh, to give a few examples, uh, on the federal side, uh, we saw in the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, the Federal Railroad Crossing Elimination Program is specifically for great separations, and that's a $5.5 billion federal investment, which is, I think, the largest investment in great separations that at least I'm, I'm aware of. Um, I'll say it that way. Uh, similarly, in the uh, CRISI program, which, is, uh, they, which has been su substantially increased in the bipartisan infrastructure law, 
Uh, that's another one that's uh, where great, great Separations are eligible projects. That one has about $10 billion there. Uh, and we actually do have some success in that one. The, the city of San Jose uh, recently applied for a Chrissy grant uh, to advance plan, the planning and design work for some of their great separations that we were supportive of. And, and we uh, wrote both letters and, 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 and helped advocate for uh, the, that particular application. And they were awarded a grant uh, by the FRA uh, in the last year. Uh, similarly, on the on the state side, as part of the uh, FY22-23 budget, uh, the legislature and the governor agreed on a uh, $350 million uh, general fund appropriation to support great separation projects across the, the state. Um, that's uh, the normal kind of level of investment in there's a Section 190 program, which has about $15 million a year. Uh, so this is a, a, a big new investment from the state towards great separations, again, I think acknowledging the need. Uh, that's out there. And then uh, just to give you a little bit of the regional context, uh, there's been work both at the MTC level in order to, uh, I, they, they've identified several crossings on the Caltrain quarter as regional priority grade separation projects and looking to pursue a variety of funding sources for those. Uh, and Caltrain's uh, just under, beginning to undertake a grade crossing study to really help answer the, the many of the questions of with so many different projects What's the right sequencing? What's the right prioritization? How do all, the, all of these things uh, align in the corridor as uh, these projects move forward? And, and I guess just the, the last thought is, uh, we've been very supportive of all the great separation efforts uh, that have been undertaken. We're certainly advocates uh, and, and uh, partners in those efforts. Uh, and uh, you know the, the, the big questions are, of course, the, the dollar signs that are associated with these, <laughs> these projects. And, uh, we really see that leveraging of funds uh, and uh, those key partnerships at all levels of government as what's been successful to this point and what will likely be needed uh, as these things move forward. Um, so I think that's just to give a sense of maybe a little bit more meat on the bones from uh, what you were asking about yeah. uh, yesterday, Director Shane. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Boris. I, uh, mainly, uh, I'm glad to hear about the, the partnerships that my concern is, look, it's going to cost a lot more money than we or the feds or anybody either have or willing to invest. But jointly, you know, I think the lead should be at the local level for the most important uh, grade, grade crossings, and we can be supportive as you described. Uh, so that, that's what I'm looking for, and, and I'm glad to know that you're doing that. that that's exactly right. Yeah. As I say, they have a lot more political clout than we do. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and, and I think that's the, the recap on, on the great sub question. Uh, so I'll turn it back to Serge for a uh, summary and closeout uh, from yesterday's conversation and, and for this presentation. Thanks, Boris. If we can just advance to the last line. Uh, before closing, I want to spend a moment to acknowledge that in the last few days, we received comments from the public presenting information for consideration before the board makes a final decision. <clears throat> We've been working closely with our team of experts, both at the authority and outside environmental experts to closely consider comments raised and the information presented. As described yesterday, the final EIR, EIS found that this project would result in certain significant environmental effects, including conflicts with prior plans. However, the project would also lead to significant environmental benefits to communities that many commenters note as outweighing impacts. We believe the final EIR EIS served its function of identifying key stakeholders with whom we must partner to refine design and develop the project to minimize and avoid identified effects. We have not identified any new information that would warrant the staff to revise the environmental effects we identified in our recommendation for the board approval. The final EIR EIS is a thorough analysis and disclosure of the project it identifies alternatives to the project and the potential environmental effects. It identifies all feasible mitigations to reduce these effects and has been prepared after extensive stakeholder coordination going back to 2008 to find an appropriate balance to deliver high-speed rail between San Francisco and San Jose. While we did hear concerns and the authority takes these concerns very seriously, we also heard from many representatives supporting the project, including San Francisco Mayor London Breed, State Senator Scott Weider, Caltrain Acting Executive Director Michelle Bouchard, Senior Deputy Executive Officer for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, Damian Breen, 
the Bay Area Council, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, SPUR, and a variety of other cities, transit agencies, and labor, business, community, and transit advocacy organizations. In closing, I'd like to restate to the board that the certification and approval completes a major milestone begun with Prop 1A in 2008. This project will be transformative for the state of California and provide many benefits for transportation, the economy, and the environment, and provides leadership for the nation as we continue to advance high-speed rail. We recommend the board certify the environmental document, approve the project, and adopt the findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations and the mitigation, monitoring, and enforcement plan, and direct the CEO to finalize and sign the record of decision. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, CEO Kelly, do you have any uh, additional comments or remarks? I'm, I'm not sure if uh, he heard that or not. I did, Tom, and I apologize. I do not. I just had trouble okay. getting back on. I do not have any okay. comments. Thank All right. You. Thank you. All right, then uh, with that, uh, do any board members have questions of staff uh, or management uh, regarding uh, regarding what we've uh, been told today. <clears throat> All right, I see none. <clears throat> Tom, the only thing I'd like to say is just uh, to thank staff for the work they did between yesterday's meeting and today. Uh, I think they presented some very thorough and clear information to us today to make our decision. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Perea. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to move on to the three agenda items that involve board decisions. The first two agenda items, 13 and 14, involve the board in its role as the California Environmental Quality Act. And the third, item 15, involves the board in its role uh, under the National Environmental Policy Act. Since these are all board actions that have legal compliance elements to them, will have counsel assist us in walking us through each one of these. I'll now uh, turn this over to Chief Counsel Alicia Fowler. Thank you, Chair Richards. As the board knows, the authority has the benefit of working with attorneys that have subject matter expertise and the compliance with both state and federal environmental laws. Our authority environmental counsel who is within uh, the authority is Minming Wu Mori, who you guys have had the opportunity to work with over the last months. And we also have um, available on today for your questions, outside counsel, Chris Stiles from the law firm of Remy, Moose and Manley. You are familiar with Ms. Wu Mori, who's advised on the past on a number of our HSR projects recently, um, but also comes to us with a pretty extensive experience from BART and from the USDOT and projects all over the Bay Area. Um, she will be walking us through the agenda items 13, 14, and 15 today. Uh, but Chris Stiles from Remy Moose Manley is also available to answer questions on any of these items. He has advised the high-speed rail along with his firm for over a decade, and he also brings deep experience working with cities and developers and is available to answer any board questions. Uh, with that, and with Ming, Ming and Chris both available, I will turn this over to Ms. Rumori. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chief Counsel Fowler. Um, good afternoon, members of the board. I am here to walk you through the last three items. The first item, agenda item, is number 13, which proposes approval of resolution number 22-19, which proposes that the board certify um, the San Francisco to San Jose Project Section Environmental Impact Report. Um, before I go into that, I just want to say a note of acknowledgement and thanks um, to our, our legal team, um, which has um, really been uh, a superb um, in helping us develop uh, this document and the process. In particular, I'd just like to um, recognize Christina Morkner Brown, who was not able to be here today from the Attorney General's office. Um, she was the Deputy Attorney General um, that uh, served on um, this particular project section environmental document. She's a former general counsel of the California Environmental uh, Protection Agency, Cal EPA, as well as former counsel for uh, the California Air Resources Board. Um, 
So uh, in addition to Remy Moose Manley, we have Christopher Stiles here today, Christina um, and the Attorney General's Office really, um, they, they've been superb um, in helping us develop these documents. Um, so uh, with that, uh, this resolution proposes that the board find that the final EIR is adequate uh, as an informational document on the project's potential environmental effects. Um, the board, as you may remember, um, you've been previously asked to undertake similar approvals for other HSR project sections three other times in the past year, in April 2022, in January 2022, and, and in August of 2021. Uh, this two-page resolution includes uh, a number of uh, whereas recitals, which provide a summary of the history of the development of the document and um, consideration of, of stakeholder input. And then it is followed by three findings um, proposed for uh, your adoption. The first finding is that the final EIR EIS has been completed in compliance with uh, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. The second finding is that the board has considered uh, the information in the final EIR EIS um, as, as it has been presented uh, previously, both today as well as yesterday. Uh, this, this document was made available to the board um, two months uh, before this board meeting. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third finding is that certification of the final EIR EIS represents your independent judgment and analysis. Um, so with that introduction, and, and given the board's prior experience um, this year with EIR certification and what it entails, I'll keep my remarks brief and defer to Chair Richards for any further questions from members of the board. Thank you, Ms. Wumori. Uh, do any members of the board have uh, questions for council? Uh, seeing none, um, we will move on to the vote for uh, item 13. I'd like to make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Item 13. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Director Perea, second by Gilmetti. Uh, would the secretary please read the roll? Director Shank? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Vice Chair Miller? Director Perea? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Scutia? Yes. Director Williams? Aye. Director Pena? Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, moving on, uh, colleagues, to item number 14. Uh, Ms. Wamori, can you please briefly walk the board through this item and the proposed resolution? Thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, so the board has voted to certify the environmental impact report as a document that adequately informs the public of the project's environmental effects. Um, certification is a prerequisite to project approval, but is not the project approval itself. This second resolution, if adopted, would approve the preferred alternative, um, the alternative that was identified as preferred by this board in 2019, between 4th and King Street in San Francisco and Scott Boulevard in, in Santa Clara as the San Francisco San Jose project section. Approval would involve board approval of uh, related documents which are attached to the resolution um, and identified in section one. And these are three documents. First, the CEQA findings of fact, uh, which describes all feasible mitigation measures that have been identified to reduce potential effects, um, significant effects that have also been um, identified um, in the findings of fact uh, that might result in the project. And then also um, any residual significant effects that, that might remain after application of the mitigation measures. The second is the statement of overriding considerations, which um, while it recognizes that the project may lead to uh, some environmental effects as identified, also identifies the policy benefits of the project. Um, that you've heard about these from staff over the past, um, over to yesterday and the past, and, and uh, today over the past two days. Um, and the statement states that uh, the project, uh, that uh, these policy benefits, if implemented, uh, would uh, outweigh the project's residual significant environmental effects. 
Um, and finally, the last document is a mitigation plan. The board would adopt uh, proposed mitigations identified um, in order to reduce, avoid, and minimize uh, the significant effects that have been identified. Section two approves a portion of the preferred alternatives that's identified in the map attached uh, in the resolution and then also described by staff um, in their prior presentations. And finally, section three directs the staff to undertake a number of next steps if the board were to approve this project. These steps largely direct staff to continue working with corridor stakeholders uh, to advance the project. Uh, and there are two specific directions um, that are proposed uh, to continue working with the cities of Millbrae and the cities of Brisbane uh, to ensure that staff explore um, all joint design and planning opportunities uh, that might be available um, and of interest to these cities uh, in order to advance the project. And with that, I defer to Chair Richards if there are any questions from the board regarding this proposed resolution. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wumori, for the explanation uh, for item 14. Uh, members of the board, are there any questions for agenda item uh, 14? Move. All right, uh, do, we have, do we have a motion for approval? Move approval. approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion from uh, Director Gilmetti, a second, I believe, from Director Escusha. Um, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Shank? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Director Preya? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Scutia? Yes. Director Williams? Aye. Director Pena? Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And we will now move on to our last agenda item, colleagues, uh, number 15. And this involves uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, Ms. Wumori, can you walk us through uh, item 15? Thank you, Chair Richards. Item 15 proposes adoption of resolution 22-21, which uh, proposes, um, which would direct the CEO to execute a record of decision consistent with the National Environmental Policy Act um, uh, of 1969. So as the board knows that the authority was assigned the federal responsibilities of serving as lead agency uh, pursuant to NEPA or the National Environmental Policy Act in 2019. And so with those assigned responsibilities, we have the responsibility uh, to ensure NEPA compliance. And um, once issued, uh, issue a record decision reflecting our decisions regarding the, the NEPA environmental decision document. Uh, so this, uh, NEPA record of decision, the draft is, uh, the proposed draft is attached to the resolution uh, and the draft includes a number of, uh, a, a number of NEPA specific findings with respect to environmental justice, um, the protection of historic cultural and legal, uh, tribal resources, Clean Air Act conformity. Um, it also describes alternatives considered, you've heard about those from staff and states a proposed decision, which is um, which would be to adopt the, the project section, which uh, you've adopted under CEQA. Uh, finally, this resolution directs the staff to undertake the same series of next steps identified in the CEQA resolution. So uh, with those remarks, I defer to the chair for any questions from the board on this final proposed environmental resolution for the San Francisco to San Jose project section. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Ms. Wumori. Any, uh, any questions for council from any of our members? Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Director Shank, a second by uh, Director uh, Camacho. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Shank? Agree. <laughs> well, yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Director Preya? Yes. Director Gilametti? Yes. Director Scutia? Yes. Director Williams? Aye. Director Pena? Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Oh. Secretary. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this concludes the 
three actions uh, items that we have for the San Francisco to San Jose uh, project section. <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank the public for the provision or providing their comp comments. Uh, thank the staff and management for the work. Uh, thank my colleagues on this board for the inordinate amount of time it takes to go through the documents and to provide the thought um, and consideration necessary to come to a conclusion on the items. Uh, I think um, beyond anything else, I'm very, very proud to be associated with all of you. Um, and we thank you, Tom, for your leadership, uh, for all the many countless hours you have volunteered to shepherd this, to work with uh, our staff and the public. So uh, I know I speak for all of our colleagues when I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very kind, but as you well know, I've only been following you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got about twice as much time on this and I, as I do, maybe more. But anyway, thank you, Lynn. Um, I, I, I would like to just uh, also uh, for a moment, I believe that uh, Director Perea would like uh, to make a comment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and also too, I wanted to thank you for your leadership and of course staff for all the great work they've done to get us where we are today on that segment. So I think it was two big days, but uh, I did want to just briefly mention last night it came to my attention and I spoke with council this morning about it, uh, about one of the items that we dealt with yesterday. So I just wanted to read uh, something into the record. Uh, we voted yesterday on item six to award a design services contract for the Merced to Madera project. I learned last night that a family member works for one of the subconsultants proposed to work on this design services contract, a company called QK. My family member is an adult and not a dependent, and so I do not have a financial interest with this member's employment, so therefore there is no conflict. But to avoid even the perception of conflict, I wanted to mention this in today's meeting and put it on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Director Perea. Um, I guess just again, I mean, this is an, uh, really a, a momentous uh, uh, amount of event and work behind it to get to where we are today with now an environmentally cleared project um, through the from the Bay Area through the Central Valley. Um, if nothing else, what it does is it really prepares and moves this entire project forward uh, towards construction uh, with of course a very important uh, component of the generating the amount of capital that's necessary to get the job done. But for the state of California, um, it really provides the basis for a project that's ready to do just that. And so uh, I know this has been a, a massive undertaking with regards to the environmental by our CEO, um, both when he more or less uh, was beating us on the head a little bit when he was still a secretary but certainly for these last uh, four plus years, um, walking into this, uh, this job uh, in, and recognizing the absolute importance of clearing this project environmentally. So uh, Brian, you deserve a great amount of, uh, of uh, respect and uh, accommodation for having done that. Um, and you brought a team that made it happen. And uh, it's not lost on any of us on this board. Uh, we thank you and we thank all of those who worked so hard to get us to where we are. Um, this day is massively important for the project. And uh, from those of us down in the Central Valley and those up in the Bay Area, we would only say to Southern California, we're on our way. <laughs> With that, if we have, if we have nothing else, um, Thank you all very much for your hard work for the last two days. Uh, we'll see you on September the 15th. So probably talk to some of you before. All of that uh, being said, the meeting is adjourned. And thank you again. Thank, thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh -huh.